Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Happy Thursday. Today's August 20th. We're about two quarters of the way into the month and pretty soon the end of the month will be upon us and we'll be in September. So the year is rocking and rolling. So let's share a couple wins. Um, anybody want to volunteer? Talk about a couple wins they've had this week. Uh, Anybody? Yeah. Uh, no, nah, I'm working with buyers. Working? Buyers. All right. All right. But not having no offer submitted. Nothing yet. Not okay. Yet. Fernando. Oh well. Uh, I guess for me, every day is stop. Honestly, every day is a, a day that I learn something good and um just to make it up and uh, while I'm still on it. Um, not every day, but you know, that makes me go on, you know, there's room for improvement. Yes. So to me, I'm always, in my mind, I'm always be like, I'm being successful on something. That's right. Every so, day is a, is a new day and a better day. Yeah. Even if uh, it gets flipped or whatever, I just, I, it's an opportunity to improve. That's you right. Know, and the way to speak to them and the way to them either do this way or this way, you know. So, mm -hmm. awesome. Thanks for sharing. Girls, anybody want to share a win this week? All right, seven new, seven new submissions is definitely a win. Okay, yeah, let's have a round of applause for that one. All right, All right. thank you guys. Now let's talk about the book of the month. The book of the month is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Um, who's reading the book? In the mornings when we're here in, in role play? Yeah, okay, Jesse, good. Well, listen to those golden nuggets, right? Because think and grow rich, it's a mindset, really. It's not a destination. It's a journey. And how you think is ultimately what you attract around you and what, what becomes reality. So I highly encourage everybody to read the book or um, make sure you show up to our 830 role plays and listen into that piece. Very, very useful. And uh, a good food for thought. August 24th is going to be a game changer class. Jesse's going to host the class. We will be preparing for the rest of the year in the last quarter of the year. Um, September 3rd is going to be global day. I encourage you guys to put them on your phone so you get a reminder a week before or a day before. So that way you're ahead of the curve there and prepared. Okay, guys. So listings taken. Anybody talking to sellers right now? Any potential sellers? Okay. Every home that lists on the market sells. On average, you're getting like 22 offers per property. It's not out of the ordinary for them to ask the lending team for a DU approval, proof of funds, credit report, the whole nine yards, even before you go see the home. So it's not like before. So sellers, if you kind of want to maybe think about selling, they're going to want to maybe eventually sell. And right now is the market for that top dollar. All those people that said they're going to wait until the economy keeps going up. This is that time that they're waiting for, right? And also buyers out there, there's still a lot of property that's very um, attainable at 530 to 550,000. Although there's a lot of competition. So buyers are getting what they want and sellers are getting what they want. Buyers are also locking in two and a half to three and a half rates. That is super, super low. At an industry standard, we haven't seen that in the 2000s. So buyers are getting what they want and sellers are getting what they want. If you're not transacting, transacting is because you're not talking to enough people, right? So we need some listings, guys. If you have any appointments or speak to anybody, invite Jesse to go to the listing appointment with you. So that way you have a team in support. Remember, you have that option as well. We have eight cells so far for the month and we need two cells this is super great because we still have another 10 days to close out the month so anybody submitting offers with buyers uh, possibly one today okay so you opening escrow maybe there's our two Teresa and abraham yeah. all right we're all going to support you and try to get some buyers converted too yeah, for that one cash a cash buyer nice yeah. okay nice Good luck. We're going to send you some 
blue energy and positivity yeah, so you can lock that in yeah, yeah. Go good okay um closings we have four closings for the month and we had six potential uh that closings that we're missing to meet our goal of 10 transactions for the month so who's all um who's all in escrow closing this month anybody closing a transaction this month Teresa okay anybody else okay so let's ramp up the these numbers for next month unless you get a cash buyer if you get a buyer that's getting finance it's gonna be very difficult to still close this month and we're now looking at September numbers so now be anytime between the 15th and the end of the month you should focus on your pipeline for the next month's closings right and when you're in between the first and the 15th you focus and push and rush all those escrows to close that month so that that way the pipeline keeps flowing and you don't get a bunch of escrows and then have a bunch of months with no escrows and then a bunch of escrows and then a, and the cycle uh, goes like a wheel, right? Um, so make sure you focus on your numbers, guys. We, we're still missing a couple closings and um, we're all pushing. Awesome. Okay. So I want to talk to you guys about loan products. So you have some knowledge and about mortgage payments. So what are the loan products available to buyers, right? This whole first time home buyer thing, what does that mean? Um, or when they talk about down payments or credit scores, you know, what is a good credit score? What is a bad credit score? So we're going to talk about a couple niches that we have in our system. And we're going to talk about FHA loans. We'll talk about VA loans. We'll talk about conventional loans. Okay. So some quick knowledge. An FHA insured loan is a U.S. Federal Housing and Administration mortgage loan mortgage insured back mortgage loan that is provided by an FHA approved lender like ourselves, Global Premier Connect. They have historically allowed lower income Americans to borrow money to purchase a home that they would not otherwise be able to afford. In essence, we can use 57% of their income to buy as a first time home buyer versus a conventional loan that only allows you to use 45% of your income. That whole extra percent could be a 500 bucks, 800 bucks a month, which allows you to qualify for more of a house. Now, VA loans and back to FHA, FHA loans, if you haven't owned a home or been on title to a home in the last three years, you're a first time home buyer. So if you own 10 years ago, you're still considered a first time home buyer. Another thing on FHA loans is if you own a home and you sell your home and buy another home and it's your primary residence, you can still qualify with the FHA loan because maybe the requirements allow you to qualify for FHA and you don't qualify conventional. Um, VA loans are for veterans. It's from the Veterans Administration. This is with a 0% down payment. A VA loan is a mortgage loan that's issued by, a private lend by private lenders and backed by the US Department of Veterans Affairs. It helps US veterans, active duty service members and widowed military spouses buy a home. VA loans, wire B, VA loans were introduced as a part of the GI bill in 1944 but they become increasingly popular in recent years I've heard borrowers tell me I want to buy with my GI bill that's the same thing as VA loans so in case you hear that the street knowledge for veterans is the GI bill I want to use my GI, GI bill to buy okay you want to use your VA loan conventional conventional loans so you can only have one FHA on your one FHA loan on your credit at any given time. You can have up to 15 conventional mortgages on your credit. So that means you could buy up to 15 houses financed before you have to start buying them cash or with hard money or private money, which is expensive, right? So what's a conventional loan? A conventional loan is a type of mortgage loan that is not is insured or guaranteed by the government. Instead, the loan is backed by private lenders and its insurance is usually paid by the borrower. Conventional loans are much more common than government backed financing. So you still have mortgage insurance on any loan if you buy it with a conventional loan, unless you buy with a 20% down payment or above. For an FHA loan, since you're using this government uh, program, you have mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. Even if it's 29 years and you're still paying, you'll have mortgage insurance. 
For conventional loans, you can get rid of mortgage insurance one of two ways. You can wait 11 years and request for it to be canceled, or you can refinance to get the current market value and eliminate mortgage insurance. And that would confirm that you have 20%, the current market value, because as you know, real estate goes up and down. Any questions about this? Yeah. Good to go? Uh, okay. For FHA or it has to be the same or? Good question. We'll cover that shortly. Okay, so let's talk about FHA loan details. We can finance someone with an FHA loan with as little as a 600 credit score. So that's really, really good. You don't have to have a paper or a 740 credit score. You can qualify with 600 and above. Refer eligible and manual underwriting is okay. This means a DU is ran. How many of you know what a DU is or an LP? Okay, so a DU approval or an LP accept is a Fannie Mae system or Freddie Mac system, that's why it's DU or LP, that approves the scenario and the borrower's credit for financing. And it's just a preliminary system that you run electronically that yes, you can manipulate and say you're going to pay this off or your income is higher. So it doesn't guarantee financing. It's just an approval of the credit and the scenario of the transaction. That's why listing agents ask for it when you submit offers because they already reviewed the borrower's credit. They reviewed their income and the scenario. So we need to run this. Your lender gets you that. You do need W-2s and pay stubs. Sometimes they'll allow you to go without tax returns if the borrower has a W-2 job like they work for the city or maybe for the train station or they have any type of W-2 pay or salary. We don't need their tax returns necessarily. Um, okay, primary borrowers okay with one FICO score. So that means that if you have two borrowers and one of the borrowers doesn't have all three FICO scores and one of them has two or just one, that's still allowable. Before we couldn't allow that. So this is an overlay that was removed. No FICO scores for co-borrower is okay. So if we have a father who's buying a house and he wants his 20 year old son to co-sign with him that's been making $30,000 a year for the last two years and the son doesn't have any credit, not even a car payment, not even a credit card, he has zero scores, he can still be a co-signer because he has zero scores, right? If he has any credit score and it's bad, then that disqualifies him. That doesn't mean what this is, is explaining. Manufactured homes are okay. Now let's talk about manufactured homes. You can finance a home in Acton that's a manufactured home, but it has to be on permanent foundation, right? So the, the document is called a, a 433A. It's an engineer's report. When a person buys a manufactured home from a manufacturer, because that's how you buy mobile homes, they mail it and ship it in a freeway in a big, uh, 18 wheeler and when it arrives an engineer um, oversees and approves that it's on permanent foundation and it's fixed. You can't move it anymore, but it's still manufactured housing. So we can still finance that. It's called a 433A. So if you show homes and you see manufactured homes, we can finance if they're in a park where you pay a land lease for the remainder of you owning that unit. In that case, um, you we cannot finance we would refer out to a bank called Santiago Financial because it's called personal property and it's not real property that we can lend upon. Teresa, do you have a question? Yeah, if it's a whole home, it's in, in one land, mm -hmm. they offer the, for the owner and then they want to sell it. You can finance that or not? For a mobile home? Yeah, if it is a mobile home. If it's on permanent that, foundation yeah. or no? Yeah. Yes, you can. You can still finance FHA or conventional or VA. But mm -hmm. even if it's not in the park. Yes, we can only lend if it's not in the park. Okay. If it's in the park, we cannot lend because then they have to pay the land lease. Okay. Yeah, we can qualify you guys, we but we'd have some, to refer you. Yeah, we find some property like that. They have a mobile home, but we have to show that somebody did not qualify. Yes, and you can if you can check the property profile, and it'll say right there, manufactured yeah. home, single family, or whatever the case is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taylor, can you get me some water, please? Thank you. And then you can do cash out with an FHA loan as well. Um, 
up to 80%. So let's say I own a home and it's worth $100,000. I can cash out $80,000 on that house. I cannot cash out more. And if my closing costs are $10,000 and I'm not gonna cash out 80, I'll cash out 70%. Thank you, sir. So you're still gonna have mortgage insurance even though you have 20% equity because it's a government loan and it's FHA, right? So you can't get away with that on FHA loans. non owner streamlines is okay. That means there's refinances. For refinances, you can always refinance. It's a rate and term and you don't have to take cash out of the transaction. Any questions on FHA? No? Okay, VA loans. VA loans are with 0% down payment, but they have something called a funding fee. So your loan is not 100% of your purchase because you finance. Your loan is 100% plus your funding fee. If your funding fee is 2.5%, you're technically living in a house where you owe, you're underwater in essence, because you owe more than what it's worth. You're gonna owe 102.5% and it's only worth 100%. Does that explanation make sense to everybody? So if you buy a $550,000 house, your loan might be 570. And until the equity goes up in the house or the appraisal, the value goes up in the house, you're gonna be underwater. But you still buy with 0% down. The FICO score is 580. The minimum FICO score, you can cash out up to a million dollars on a refinance. That's our max loan amount for VAs. So what does manual underwrite mean? Manual underwrite means that if we get a refer eligible and Fannie Mae says, we don't want to accept this scenario, he's gonna get a refer, but he's eligible, which means if you restructure a piece, you will qualify. So an underwriter from the bank will manually go through the loan and approve or deny it. You would get a refer if the FICO score is from 580 to like 619 or 599. I've seen above 600 or 620, you'll get an approved eligible and you don't have to do the manual piece. The only difference is you're probably gonna get a higher interest rate because there's more risk to the bank, right? No DTI cap with AU or I'm sorry, W-2s and pay stubs only. That's all we need to qualify the person. W-2s and pay stubs. They, in essence, work for the government. So they'll give us, give us their pay stubs from their direct deposit. No DTA, DTI cap. Debt to income ratio is what I discussed earlier, where we can use 57% of the consumer's income to qualify them for FHA and only 45% to qualify them for a conventional loan. There's no requirement on VA. You can get an approval up to 60% debt to income or 55 or 45. It's on a case by case basis. Um, okay. Manufactured homes okay as well. They do have appraisal waivers for VA loans as well. We run it on the system and it will accept it or reject it telling us if they're approved or denied or if the home is approved or denied for an appraisal waiver. Okay, conventional loans. So conventional loans start with a credit score of 620. I find that if you have a credit score under 700, you're gonna have a high interest rate and probably high mortgage insurance. So I always recommend if you go conventional, it's a great option, but try to work on your credit. Try to have that 5% down payment with some reserves. Okay, so they do have competitive rates. How do you see the 2.5% and the 2.99% interest rates? You go with a conventional loan and you have a 700 plus credit score. They don't just give you a kick-ass rate just because the market is low, right? They also see if there's risk. If you didn't pay you know, your car two years ago for a couple of months, they see you know, those, op those alternatives. They wanna make sure that you're an eligible borrower. So rates are really, really, really competitive, but they like to see a clean history. When your tax returns are self-employed with AUS, a lot of my self-employed borrowers wanna file just one year of taxes, buy their house, and that's it. Keep filing their $10,000 a year. That's allowable and it's not breaking the law. As long as they report the income tax and pay the IRS what they have to pay, and that's what their income is, then they can go ahead and do that and qualify. 
So when your tax returns are eligible for self-employed borrowers, as long as our DU accepts it, or our AUS, Automated Underwriting System, 97% loan to value with 625 FICA scores, there's a program that's 3% down for conventional loans that's on a case-by-case -case basis. We search the property on the website for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and if it approves it, it would give you the map of where 3% down qualifies or doesn't qualify. Um, W-2s and pay stubs only, you do not need tax returns. Once we run the, the AUS, we'll know if you run, if you need tax returns or not. Non-owner occupied, you can buy an investment property, but the down payment is 20% down. So if you buy a house that's worth $100,000, you need a $20,000 down payment to purchase it. And then your closing costs as well. Um, if I have a quick question. In this case, um, we can finance up to 15 properties. I mentioned that earlier, that's Fannie Mae's requirement or minimum uh, finance amount. Manufactured homes, the same thing. They have to be on permanent foundation with a 433A. 100% gift funds, okay. So what does that mean? Let's say you have a borrower that has a cash business and he, ha he has a liquor store and he handles a lot of cash and he doesn't do regular deposits. So he, to get his $30,000 down payment, he doesn't have the money in the bank, he has a cash. You need a gift, a, a donor, which is a family member that gives you the money to purchase a property. They could give the wire straight to escrow and that way the money never touches the borrower's account and he would be the donor, right? Uncle or cousin or whoever the case may be. So 100% gift funds are okay. That means that you don't have to have the money from your account to buy the house if you're the buyer using the credit, using your credit. So they have a 15% down payment product for investment purchases, but you don't have to give a 20% down payment. It's on a case by case basis. And this bank that we work with also offers that. They also allow drive-by appraisals. With this whole COVID situation, they've allowed something called a drive-by appraisal, which means the appraiser just drives by the home, snaps a couple photos, goes in the area, takes a look at the comps, and then appraises the property that way. I don't really like it because they can't really see upgrades in the home or how nice the kitchen is or the bathrooms, but it, it works in some times, right? So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, any questions on conventional loans? Okay. David, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I have a quick question, actually, with regards to the, the down payment. I know you had mentioned some programs offer 3% and then standard 5. Yes. Um, and then investments, 20%. And we can, well, they can have up to 15 conventional loans. Does it stay yes. at 20% after, I mean, I guess the first or second conventional, or does it keep going higher as the amount of, properties that they own or that they want That's to own. a good question. It would stay at 20% down. Okay. So Elizabeth's question is, if you buy one, two or three or four homes, are they going to require more of a down payment? The answer is no. It would always be 20% down if it's an investment property. Even if it's your 10th home or 15th home, you still have to qualify with your credit and your income. Remember that. Yes. I have another question. Uh, ideally, um, local premier would like to have an in-house lending? Is that something, or, or when somebody brings a pre-approved letter, is that frowned upon? Or Not at all. You can definitely work with any buyer who's been pre-approved by Chase, Wells Fargo, um, broker Joe Schmo. I mean, we can, you can work with anybody as long as they're eligible and you have a pre-approval letter. We always love the opportunity to bat for the consumer and you guys and beat their interest rate, maybe reduce fees, do something to give them an incentive to work with us. But if at the end of the day, it doesn't happen, we also understand that. But you're, you're correct. You can work with anyone that's been approved with any mortgage lender in California. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you, David. You're welcome. Let's talk about mortgage payments. So how do you calculate a mortgage payment for a home? You know to not leave out any piece of a mortgage payment by remembering your acronym PITI, right? P 
PITI means principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, PITI. So when you give someone a mortgage payment, you can never forget any of those items or you're quoting a wrong mortgage payment, right? Another thing is if you're showing condos, townhouses, you're gonna have to calculate the HOA. So remember that the HOA is part of your uh, payment uh, breakdown in those scenarios. Now, how do you calculate a mortgage payment? On the web, you can go through this website, mortgagecalculator.org. For your iPhone, we have an app as well. These are all free apps, guys. So you don't have to text your, text your loan officer. You don't have to reach out to your broker. You don't have to ask somebody else. You have all the power in the palm of your hand. Go also, ahead. Uh, the MMS has a calculator where you can just move the bar. Yeah. At the price and in the down payment and the interest rate. If you know That's it. super cool. And it gives you the breakdown. It has the uh, principal interest, the uh, home insurance, and property taxes. Nice. So Abraham was saying that the, what app is that? The MLS. The MLS has the payment breakdown option in your application. That's super cool. Does it get mortgage insurance? It does. Oh, mortgage insurance too. Even better. Uh, yeah. It has, uh, yeah. And even? And the MLS app. And, and then, then just to add to, go ahead. sorry, dude. Just to add to what Abraham was saying, um, for the properties that have an HOA, the MLS already includes it in the payment, so oh, it includes okay. um, the estimate with what you say the PITI plus the insurance and the HOA. Right. So Elizabeth is saying that the MLS app already includes your HOA payment, which is even better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Screenshot that and send it to your consumer. <clears throat> Okay, we have an Android app as well. This is the one that I use. So you guys probably recognize this logo. It's um, Mortgage Calculator Pro for all you Android users. Boop, boop. No? No? Okay. All right, yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So rates. Let's talk about how you know what rate to put in this system. You know how to put the rate by either checking on Google Google what the average average rate is or going back to your recent email that I send you from our company's database of rates. Every morning you should be receiving interest rates for what the market is doing. If you don't know how to read that, let me know so I can break it down for you. You're gonna have borrower paid rates and lender paid rates. What's the difference? Borrower paid rates means that our commission is forfeited from the bank and we have to charge the consumer one to 1.5% of our commission that the borrower pays. Now, if you have all that credit from the seller in a closing cost situation, then technically the borrower doesn't pay that and we charge the seller, right? So that's borrower paid. It's the raw rates. Remember, we can offer that, but we're gonna charge the borrower the consumer just like you guys charge your sellers the commission. Lender paid is what the market is at zero cost and the borrower doesn't have to pay anything. Right now the market is odd, which means lender paid is coming in at a cost to the consumer because there's so much competition out there. So when borrowers say, how much is this gonna cost me? How many points? Well, the answer is if you want the lowest rate, it's gonna cost you one point, right? Any questions? Okay. Now this is a scenario with the web calculator. We have the home value, your down payment, your loan amount, your interest rate. We have your terms. Guys, almost everybody's always gonna want 30 years. If there was 40 or 50 years, that's what they'll go for, okay? Because the payment would just be cheaper. So 30 years is usually our go-to because they want the cheapest payment. We're conscious, we live in Los Angeles and it's like the, the top second or third most expensive city in the United States. So mortgage payments are not gonna be a thousand bucks or 800 bucks like Nevada or Utah. They're gonna be more like, you know, $3,000, $3,500, $4,000 getting into the seven and 800 of a purchase price. So 30 years is your norm go-to. Your tax rate per year, how do you calculate this? You can go ahead and in this case, you have to put in a number. So you can put out your calculator and the Los Angeles County tax rate is always 1.25%. So you take your purchase price, let's say it's $100,000 and you 
multiply it by 1.25% and you're going to get $1,250. You divide that by 12 and that's your monthly tax rate for your property. That's your monthly property tax. And if you want to find out how much you pay in April and November, all you do is multiply by six months because it's six months each time when they're due in November and April. Um, in this case, they're already included in here. So I hope that the system automatically calculated based on the appraised value. Your mortgage insurance is 0.5%. It looks like it calculates it for you as well. Homeowners insurance. Homeowners insurance, in order to get an actual quote, you got to really reach out to your homeowners insurance person. But any home around 500,000 is going to be like 60 bucks to 75 bucks, depending on how big the lot is, if there's other structures. And that's a whole homeowners insurance policy. That includes liability of like 20,000 if someone breaks their ankle there or a dog bites them. It includes a personal, personal property of 25 or 30,000 if someone breaks in and takes the TVs or something. It includes a structural, there's a fire, um, God forbid, but if you just want the bare homeowner's insurance for just the fire, which is required by law, then you could probably get in even a cheaper one at 45 bucks or so. Um, but more or less, that's why it was a hundred, a thousand per year, probably around the 85 mark per month, any HOA, that's where you would put it if there's a condo here. And then this is a refi scenario, but you can choose if it's a purchase the credit rating as well, it's probably gonna give you poor, good, and excellent. Poor is in the 500s, good is in the 600s, and excellent is in the 700s, okay? We don't discriminate, but obviously we want everyone to be in the 700s because we wanna give our borrowers the best rate. They think sometimes that we control the interest rate and, and we're giving them a low, you know, uh, or a high rate or, or expensive cost. At the end of the day, if they just have a 601 and barely qualify and their income is right there, we're making it happen and we're still getting them the house, but shit, you barely qualify. So the numbers might be a little bit different, right? Yeah. So poor, 500s, good, 600s, excellent, 700s. The other application is gonna be our iPhone application. Very useful, same thing. You put in your purchase price, your down payment, 10% is this scenario, but FHA starts at three and a half percent down. Your rate, 4.5%. Right now, the market is about, you know, 2.993% for FHA, a little bit higher for conventional, about half a percent more. 30-year fixed. Your taxes, this says 1.2%. So the tax rate for 1.25, some areas have more and some areas have less. But 89% of Los Angeles is 1.25. Canyon country might be at 1.3 or 1.5 or 3% of a tax rate because they have Melarus and they have special assessments. Does anybody knows what, know what that is? No. Okay, basically that's the extra tax to live in that community, to have the fire department down the street or the hospital right there, right? Um, there was a house in Silmar we just ran a tax rate on and it was 1%. I think it was because of a smaller lot, I'm not sure, but. It was just lower, saving the, the buyer money. Your insurance, 1,500, HOA, 200 per month, and mortgage insurance as well. <clears throat> this is your Android app, very much the same and super useful. It already includes your mortgage insurance. I like this one because if you put conventional and you put your actual credit score, it would give you a mortgage insurance pricing based on your credit score. So I recommend you find one that has that. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of calculating a mortgage payment and our huddle for today. Does anybody have questions? Um, I, I do, I have one. How, how do you uh, calculate what the, the, the uh, closing cost is? Is that different for every uh, purchase? Very good point. It is different for every purchase and there's no real percentage where you can say a house of 300,000 is gonna have a 3% closing cost breakdown. Because what if you have a house of 100,000? The closing costs are not $3,000, right? So for example, um, on a $500,000 house, it's more or less 10 to $11,000 in closing costs. I think that the best route is 
Were you in our closing cost class a couple weeks ago or months ago? Uh, probably. I, I okay. Said, yeah. um, would it be useful for me to give a closing cost class? Yes. Yes? Okay. So next class, I'm going to give a closing cost class. If you guys would like an Excel spreadsheet of the estimate that I give the consumer after I pre-approve them, most of you guys have seen that worksheet. I will give it to you and teach you how to plug in your numbers so you know exactly how to do that and give it to someone without me being present. Let's knock an hour to get together and you guys automatically will know how to calculate closing costs for anybody at any purchase anytime. Yes. And also, um, you know, most buyers will tell you that they can afford a certain amount of month, right? Yes. But then as they go along, they start to go higher. Because uh, they know they could uh, come out with the uh, extra, mm -hmm. just, you know. Uh, and and uh, so, like the buyers I have right now, they told me they wanted to stay at 32, 3500. Now mm -hmm. they're at 37, 3800. Okay. Uh, but the closing cost is what I'm having trouble with, them, you know. And, and yesterday the agent told them, and you know what, if you're still just submitting offers and asking for closing costs, you're not going to get any property. Yeah. In this market. Mm -hmm. So, they kind of opened up their, you know. That's a very good point. Yeah. We've seen a lot of offers denied because they're asking for closing costs. Right. The easiest way is to open escrow, do your legal investigations, and should you find something wrong with the home, submit a request for repairs or money back. So you open the transaction with no money being requested from the seller, you lock in your contract, your buyer, your property, and then if something happens and you find out that there's a bunch of termite or there just needs money to, to fix the property and after your inspection and your appraisal, you can ask for money and then get $5,000 back or $10,000 back. That's another alternative route as well. Use it for um, costs. Yes, and use it for your closing costs instead of for the repairs. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. Um, I've seen that they ask for more than the purchase price and then money back, but in this market, it is a little tough because a lot of people are doing that, right? But um, that's also another route. If the house is worth 500,000 and they can qualify for 600,000, you can offer 515 or 510 and ask for 10 back or 525 and ask for 10 back and the seller still makes more money on top of what the house was listed. So there's a negotiating tactic. You don't want to go too high up because then you're going to, um, be unrealistic and if the appraisal doesn't even come in at value, maybe you don't even have a deal at the end of the day, right? Yeah. But if you want to take a look at comparables, look them up on the property profile. And if you need some help with that, then reach out to Jesse or myself or anybody that can help you out with that to, to check the value before you submit. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Carlos Gallardo was submitting offers for a buyer and they countered four people and he was one of them. And he said, should we go up any more in purchase? And Jesse recommended he talk to the listing agent. The listing agent told him, go up only three or 4,000. He actually gave him the information that would put him into escrow. And he said, and leave all the other terms the same because nobody's matching you. Like, okay, all that took was a courtesy call to the listing agent and a pleasant conversation. And you were able to find out three or 4,000. Yes, and we're gonna go 10,000 more, right? So you save the customer six, six, seven thousand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of David. Yes. Sorry. Just to share, uh, one of the biggest things that I found within the last couple of weeks with regards to the market is the relationship that you build with the with the agent, with the listing agent, is gonna either make or break the deal sometimes. Um, just to give an example, as you had mentioned, uh, with regards to my offer, uh, I reached out to. Um, a couple of years in the office <laughs> and um, I had came in a little bit too strong with regards to our offer and he had asked to remove the appraisal at one point but I think also our experience and confidence comes in uh, when you're matching or when you're looking at the comparables that when you come in with this type of information they'll feel comfortable trusting um, that you know what you're doing so that's actually how I was able to get my offer accepted is because at first he tried to hit me hard and say remove appraisal but i came back and was like look this is what i ran these are the comparables so you you tell me where we stand because i know where we're at and yeah. luckily he he told me he's like you know what i 
can feel the confidence in you and I know what you're talking about, we're going to open that store. And we actually did on Monday. So super, super it's important awesome. that we're, yeah, that the so comparable piece is really, what you said if you didn't hear, go ahead. What? <laughs> to reiterate what Elizabeth said, basically, she said, um, build a relationship with the listing agent. Right. When you submit an offer, make sure you also text him and copy the loan officer. Hey, I just sent in an offer and here's the deal. She said she had a, a counter where the listing agent said, remove your appraisal contingency. And she sent him the comps and said, well, here's where we're at. Let me know what you think. And, and we really don't want to go above uh, what the market is actually going to value this home at. And the listing agent responded to her that he liked the confidence. She knows what she's doing. Let's open escrow. So that's a super good win. Yeah. Um, and great way to build a relationship with that agent because I'm sure his phone's blowing up with calls and texts of, you know, can we see the house? Can we submit? Yeah. Cool. Um, final thoughts, comments, questions, or concerns? All right, guys. Make it a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.